Hello, Dr. Shippy. I am so happy to have you here. <laughs> yeah. um, so and for everybody you. listening, I am, first of all, just welcome. This is a beautiful Saturday in Boulder. I don't know how it is where you're at, Anne, um, but beautiful weather here. It was like 90 degrees when I got in my car. I don't think it's quite that hot, but it's very warm and sunny and beautiful. Um, so as always, if you need more information about me, um, www.jillcarnahan.com and please feel free to share. We're going to share all of Anne's links and her websites and all her information. So stay tuned and I'll be sure and put these in the, the links so you'll get to know her and I want to introduce her as well. Um, just a little housekeeping, feel free to share. Um, you can always watch this later so it is recorded and you can go listen later if you missed the first part. Um, and like I said, please throw in your comments, questions, anything at all that you'd like to hear more about and I will try to be watching that on the side so that if you have questions, we can answer those in real time. If we do miss your questions, um, just put them in there and we'll come back, both Dr. Shippey and I, and we can throw in um, links to our websites or any questions that you might have on that. So anyway, here we go. So Dr. Shippey, I want to introduce you and then um, we'll jump right in. So Dr. Shippey, first of all, the personal thing is she's a friend. And I remember when we first met and just feeling this like connection, she's an intuitive, wise soul. And, uh, and we both will talk today about mold experiences and mold toxicity and um, our experiences with this. That's how it kind of led us both to this journey. I don't think you ever pick mold, mold picks you. So we have a similar story in that, but now we're kind of parallel. She's in Texas and I'm in Colorado and maybe someday we'll be nearby each other, but um, we both have a very similar passion and just a similar even way of uh, dealing with a patient, a similar personality. So it's lots of similarities. And I remember just thinking what a special, beautiful soul that she was when we met. And uh, as we've become friends, it's just become even more beautiful. So you will enjoy. I, I, I feel so blessed to have you in my life. You are such a bright light. <laughs> just every yeah. time I get to the same. <laughs> it's totally mutual. It's like this incredible energy. Um, and the longer I live, the more it really is about energy, like energetically people, like even, you know, I don't have a lot of negative people in my life, but I try to keep that to a minimum because the, the beautiful positive energy is so sustaining and filling and growing. And those people that are energy vampires, um, God bless them, <laughs> but we need to, you know, make sure that they're not, they're not too close at hand. So I'm going to formally introduce you and then we'll jump in. So Dr. Okay. Ann Shippey is on a mission to educate and help people across the world live their healthiest, most optimal lives possible using cutting edge science, research, and genetic information to find and treat the root cause, not just symptoms of illness. And if you've been around here, you guys know that us functional medicine, we do this very well. Anne is, is a leader in this. Um, she specializes in environmental toxicity, preconception and reproductive wellness and mold exposure. And that's a great combo. I have two close friends recently that had miscarriages because of mold. This is, and I think you've heard me talk a little bit about this. Hopefully we can go into that, Anne, because that's such a unique thing. Um, she uh, has designed life altering treatments and protocols for her patients using epigenetic information, which is the study of DNA expression and the body's incredible ability to express or repress helpful or detrimental genes, as well as heal, prevent, and even reverse certain illnesses. Now, what's so cool about her, she, she's a ex IBM engineer. I'm ex bioengineer. So we've got these really cool combinations. And I've never met anyone like Anne that like takes, she's a scientist at heart. She is a processes person. She sees complex uh, problems like I do. Um, but then we also have this real spiritual intuitive sense that we kind of meld. And it's so rare to find that in someone like you, Anne. Um, but I think it's the most powerful way to see patients because the science is great. We love the science. We have our foundation on good medicine. But this toolbox and being able to intuit and really sense where the patient's at. It's so important, isn't it? It is so important. And a lot of times when I do get to get a lot of data on the patient, you know, there's a million different directions you can go in and different things to prioritize at different times. And I think that's a lot of times where the experience, but the intuition comes in. It's like, okay, what do we do next with the data that we have? That is so powerful. It really, really is. Um, what I've seen is like the experience of 20 years of the science over and over and over again. And then now at our age, which we won't reveal, but our oh. age and experience, right? Um, we're both, especially since we both had birthdays. I know, right? This week. Yeah. 
So we are both Gemini, by the way, and we are both celebrating June 1st and June 4th. We both just celebrated our 29th birthday. Can you believe it? And it's like we got so you know, much done for 29 years. <laughs> I know. I love it. I love it. Um, and you look 29. You look amazing. So. You look amazing. <laughs> oh, but back to that whole, so we've had the experience, but what I find is now that we've had the experience, we can take all of that experience, which drives the intuition and look at problem solving and data collection in a different way. Because I feel like when you use your analytical mind, you can process 10 or 20 or 100 or 1,000 pieces of data and do it pretty well like a computer. But when you tap into the intuitive, spiritual sense of what's deeper, emotional, you actually feel someone where they're at, um, it's a whole different level of information gathering. And I feel like it's exponentially, like literally millions of pieces of data instantaneous in the subconscious. And how I look at it is like, I have this sense of, oh gosh, I think we need to move in this direction. And then I use the science to prove it. Like I'm not just out there guessing, right? But yes. I'd love to hear your take on it because you're so similar in this. I know, there's just sometimes, <laughs> sometimes, uh, so when the first time I see a patient, I get to spend about two to three hours with them. I think you do the same kind of thing. And I give them a plan for uh, the dietary changes I'd like them to make, supplements I'd like them to take, and then tests I'd like to, them to go. Yeah. And I love it when my initial impression of intuition and, and impression of what I think they need <laughs> when the data comes back and it backs that up. And then also the patient starts to feel the difference with even just that initial pass. It doesn't always happen, but when it does, it just is so affirming that, um, you know, this, what we, you and I both believe what, when the body has what it needs and it's not overwhelmed by things like mold and other things in the environment. And we've accounted for the person's genetics. It really is amazing how much they can heal just dramatically. Yes. I love that. And I, I feel the same because it's always like you have that first visit. And if you just give them, you know, a load of tests to do and not a lot of help or helpful information. So our job in the very beginning without any labs necessarily, they might've brought stuff in, but sometimes it's just their story and just us being really good listeners. I'm sure you found the same, like listening is our most important skill, right? That's, that's one of my favorite things. Like I love the new patient visit because that really is my time to to listen. I list, listen in every visit, but that in depth where the person can just everything that comes up, like it's like they're emptying their basket and they're, they're handing it over to me. And it, it's such precious time. I love that you use the word precious because I feel I was going to say the same thing in the sense of like, it's almost like we have this, I'm getting goosebumps now, but like <laughs> we have this incredible gift that people are giving us this in like rarely does someone t share the information, the types, the depth, the past childhood experiences, the illness, the trauma. I mean, everything. And sometimes we get to sit there and really hear such an expanse of their entire lives. And I find it so sacred. Um, but if we create that space and, and uh, I definitely do ask questions, but a lot of times I'm just listening really, wow, tell me more. And those kinds of things open it up. And then the patient really knows the answers in their, in their bodies, right? So don't you find if you listen closely, they'll tell you where to go. They'll tell you the direction. They'll kind of guide that anyway. And usually they're right. I mean, often they know. It's interesting because that's usually the case where the person's intuition, when they really have a chance to express it, um, it, it bubbles up and comes out, whether it's, you know, they're really aware of it or not, but it's like their bodies will start to yeah. share. Yeah. And then it's so fascinating too, because the place that the person has the most resistance to, like sometimes giving up, like giving up dairy or <laughs> something like that. They're like, no, 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 that's not a problem for me. Do that. The more resistance that we hit on something, sometimes that's a really important place to go to. And I noticed that in myself too. Yes. <laughs> like when I have resistance towards, oh yeah, I know I should do that, but you know, maybe it's not that bad. <laughs> And, and I can really think of story after story in my own life. I remember years ago after the Crohn's diagnosis, gluten I took out, that was easy. Dairy was so hard and it was so essential. But I like, oh, I love my cheese. Even though I didn't drink milk, it took me a few years to give that up. But it made such a difference. For those of you listening, if you're like feeling this resistance, it might even be like corn or something random. But a lot of times there's truth there. And then the same thing with even as a clinician, I remember like I would have never chose to go into mold illness. 
Like I said, oh, it goes yeah. right? Like that's no. First of all, I didn't want to know about it. It's complex. It causes trauma. And it's also something, what I found, there's nothing else where like you could lose your house or your livelihood or your job or your car. Or it really can be massively devastating to the patients. And so for me as a clinician to come in and say, yeah, your house is a problem and it's got to be remediated. You have to move or you get to stay, but it's going to cost a lot of money. The financial implications and even the implications to a patient's safety are so profound that it's a whole nother level of getting involved in their lives. And then I found in the beginning, I wasn't a hundred percent sure. So I'd be afraid to tell them how serious I thought it was because you don't want to be the one to tell someone to move when they don't really have to move. Oh, Did you yeah. ever encounter that? Like, like, fear of, oh gosh, how much do I push and what do I say? So much responsibility sometimes mm -hmm. to have, have people really do what's right for their health, like that initial nudge to, yes. to make that investment or to make those big changes. And yeah, it, sometimes it's, especially when you know how hard it's going to be for the person to, to make those changes, it's... It's really, really tough sometimes. Yes. And yet as you've had more experience like me, I'm sure you're getting more and more confident because you see the ramifications of the seriousness. Like for me, I'm finally like, wow, it's either, you know, if they want to be healthy, I have to be more bold. And, and I've gotten a little bit more confident in recommendations, but it's still hard. <laughs> yeah. In fact, I used to like do everything else first that I could think of yes. and then be like, oh, okay, this oh. mold must be, really be a bigger deal. So we need to do that unless... I yeah. don't wait as long anymore to, to, to go there. I and could agree more. Fact, I'm just really shifting towards, you know what? It's, it's everybody, even if you don't have any symptoms yet from it, it is, it, it's changing your gene expression. It's damaging your mitochondria. It's, you know, it is not a positive trajectory. We, you know, I'm hoping at some point that we can all, um, all have built homes and offices and places to be that are constructed in a way that we don't have even a chance of having mold. That's my dream. Oh, that'd be amazing. And the sad thing is it's um, so prevalent. I have a colleague, like professional colleague who just tore apart their master bath and the builder literally slapped on tile um, onto drywall with no barrier, no nothing. And it's completely moldy all the way through the subfloor. I mean, it's horrendous. And this is like a real well-known builder. This is like uh, not, it's a really good situation that you would think, but it's horrendous. So super common. So we were, can you hear me okay? We it were happened. It's oh. so, yeah. It, yeah, I, um, I think we're good Sorry, now. I'm in no, Santa Fe. I'm not oh. at my office. And so it may be. No, I think we're it good. Maybe my internet. <laughs> no worries. Uh, I would love to hear your story of how did you get in touch? How did you experience mold? Um, if you want to tell us a little bit more about your experience. Yeah. So a, a little over ten years ago, I got to go to one of the environmental health symposiums that Bill Ray put on, mm -hmm. and his topic for that year was um, was talking and I knew nothing about it, but something really nudged me to go. Um, and at that point in time, there was so little out there about, about mold. You know, what we learned in med school was that if you're immunocompromised, it could cause a major infection and that's about it. Um, so I, after the conference, Oh, I'm missing this in a few of my patients. And I had a woman who had had, um, you know, major hormonal disruptions and, um, and it turned out that they were in a new house, less than a year old, that the windows weren't installed properly. So they had mold around all their windows. And then we experienced a bunch of heavy rains in Austin and I had a hidden leak in my house and an obvious one in my office. <laughs> and, but it still didn't dawn on me that, that um, what was going on, I started having severe neurological issues with my right arm. I, um, I was so weak in my right arm that I could hardly hold a glass if it was full, I could drop it. And my hair was falling out. I had so much pain in my body that it was hard for me to, my kids were kind of young at that time for them to hug me. And um, so I started, you know, calling my colleagues, <laughs> my functional medicine colleagues, hey, what do you think is happening to me? I can't figure it out. And um, I went to a hand specialist and a neurologist and nobody had any ideas. So 
one day, it was one of my worst days. Um, it was a Monday morning and I, um, I just, I had dropped a glass when I went to take my supplements and I, I got kids off to school and I got back in bed for a few minutes and I just was praying that I, that I, you know, I just felt like I was not going to make it if I didn't figure this out. And one of my last appointments that day, the, um, the patient was feeling amazing. She'd had environmental, um, illness was doing great. And she, I, we were almost done with the appointment and she appeared across the table and she said, Dr. Shippy, I think you have cheetomium in your house. And, um, I want to come to your house after you get off work. And I, did I, have I even told you this story? Wow. She's like, what's your address? Wow. What time? And she met me there. So she was just highly intuitive. And even though I thought I had it all together, uh, she obviously could tell that I didn't. And um, she walked in, she walked into the house and within a few minutes she had to get out and she, you know, really didn't feel well for a couple of days after getting, I had a really bad cheetonium problem in my house. And um, she's like, don't take any of your belongings, get your kids out and get out now. <laughs> she, she like read me the riot act <laughs> and she was right. Like I fought it a little bit. I thought um, I could clean some things that I couldn't. And um, it, it was a little journey and realizing, you know, cause she, that's the mold that she had been um, exposed to. And there was so little out about it at the time. But after, you know, in increasing my detox pathways and being out of the house for a few months, I, I totally healed. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, and that ketomium, gosh, that is, I think it's worse than stachybotrys. I think it's a really nasty mold. I think it's the worst of the worst neurologically and immune system wise. Um, in my experience, this might just be me and my genetics, but I call it the narcoleptic mold because whenever I get exposed to it, I want to lie down no matter where I'm at and fall asleep. <laughs> both, both stacky and chitomium? Chitomium particularly. Oh, yeah. oh yeah. that's fascinating. Yeah. So it's like literally knocks and it's just like a, it's not like a fatigue, like, oh, I need a nap. It's like, I don't care if I'm on a concrete sidewalk, I'm going to lay down and sleep right now. It's like, it's literally almost narcoleptic to me. <laughs> yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Interesting. Did you feel like foggy and tired? If you look back at the I, did. I, you know, I think, oh, Monday morning, I'm going to feel great, but I could hardly get out of bed. Wow. And yeah. Yeah. And you probably know, I, I just had, um, I Boulder flood 2013, my office flooded, but I, now in hindsight, it's so clear the basement was damp and had probably mold issues before the flood was flooded in the flood. And then my office was built right above an unfinished crawl space. Like now, oh, I'm like, oh duh. And I'm sure it was loaded it. And it actually, I think had some water or damp, definitely dampness, if not like standing water, like right under my floor. Now, again, I didn't even know this shortly after I've learned it since then. And then this is the funny thing. So I had this older building, probably in the seventies and um, my builder redid just my office and it was beautiful bamboo floors and brick, uh, no, actually uh, stone inside the office. Like it was beautiful, but he threw bamboo right on top of old carpet over in old I know, right? Who, who does that? Like looking back, I'm like, that was crazy. And it was soft, right? When you walked on it. Duh. Every time I walked, it probably squished up mold spores. <laughs> like now that I know something about construction and flooring, I'm like, who in the right mind would put bamboo right over carpet? I don't even know. But now it's so clear. And like you, I had brain fog and fatigue. I had rashes around my eyes, uh, rashes all over my body, really. And I had um, red, irritated eyes, congestion, respiratory issues. I didn't mm. have a lot of neurological symptoms. But if I look back, fine motor, like I got in a lot of like tiny little accidents, for example, I pull into a parking garage every day. I've had the same parking spot for five years. And right around the time when the mold was the worst, I hit the concrete pole right next to my spot with my brand new Lexus. <laughs> but the funny thing was like, I had no perception. So that whole um, ability to perceive and sense space and time. That perception issue is, a, is one that I think is so easy to overlook um, as one of the symptoms of mold exposure because I think it, I've seen it multiple times now, like it really does increase your risk for having a, either a minor accident like that or a major one. I had a patient who had a major, wow. it, we, you know, we were in the process of, um, of having her, you know, start to get treated and she had a really bad 
you know, like that uh, accident uh -oh. because she didn't have the depth perception. Yeah, I'm not surprised. And you've probably done some neuroquants like I have, and we see these parts of the brain that are, I mean, there's a lot of, so there's hypertrophy and atrophy. So neuroquant, let's go back to that. So often we'll do an MRI of the brain, which is just a normal picture, um, magnetic resonance imaging of the brain. That doesn't show a whole lot with mold by itself. Um, I would say I sometimes see uh, abnormal white matter changes that are nonspecific. Do you see that, Anne? Oh, yeah. And then, yeah. And then just changes in sizes of the, the different yeah. parts of the brain. Mm -hmm. And then a neural plan is just a computer program that takes, a, takes that picture and takes each sphere, like say they take the hippocampus, they blow it up into a circular size and say, what's the volume? And they know the standards over your age ranges. So your hippocampus might be shrunk or like 2% of normal and your um, white matter might be uh, hypertrophied, which is enlarged and inflamed. So what we usually see is patterns of um, you know, central like temporal lobe or frontal lobe or different things that are hypertrophied or swollen and inflamed. And then some things like amygdala, which is responsible for fight or flight or hippocampus, and they're actually shrunken. Now, some of the worst cases I see are, are the small hippocampuses because that's all about memory. And we see that with dementia and um, mold related. Any um, thoughts on your findings with the brain or, or patterns that you've seen? Yeah, um, I think just kind of a side note, I think some, if somebody's kind of in resistance about mold being the issue, um, having those findings and showing that it's actually affecting their brain is one of the ways to kind of get their attention if they're resistant to it and not really, you know, wanting to go there. Um, it, um, but I do think it's kind of scary for people to see, oh my gosh, my brain is uh, changing. But I guess the good thing is that with treatment, yeah. that things can go back towards normal. You know, are you seeing that too? Where you Absolutely. see? Absolutely. Um, my personal, I had five years ago and then recently an MRI to compare, and there's a lot of really good changes. Um, my hippocampus went, it was normal. It never was um, atrophied, but it increased by 34%. So that was, I was like, <laughs> I know. I know we got to talk about this because there's like a, there's a case study here. I'm like, wow, yeah. it went from uh, whatever that would be 50 to 84% somewhere in that range. Like it was, I was like, wow. Now there's other things that aren't normal. No <laughs> wonder you're so smart. <laughs> no, no. Okay. I'm going to be real personal now. So I've never shared this, but there's another little tiny section sliver of the brain that's actually, we don't know a lot about. It's, I think the superior temp temporal lateral sulcus, or I might be saying that wrong because I don't have it in front of me. It's one of those, we don't talk about a lot. Mine was kind of lower percentage. I'm like, well, what is this responsible for? So it is responsible for recognition of behavior and anticipating um, like good or bad, dangerous, non-dangerous on people's faces and in their behavior. Now, again, there's no science to say that that being um, small on my MRI means that I will actually have any of these symptoms. So we're kind of really going out there on a limb, but I'm going to share something really funny. And then there's another, another study on that that links it to a little bit of cognitive, lack of cognitive empathy. Now, emotional empathy is like you feel someone deeply, you feel their pain or sorrow or whatever. Well, this was cognitive empathy, which is like putting yourself in someone else's shoes. And in 2015, it was a little bit abnormal in my brain, probably from the mold. And in hindsight, I literally called my ex-husband up when I got my brain MRI and said, Aaron, you know, can you tell me more about my behavior? I do remember in the mold, it was so traumatic and it was so stressful and I was so sick that I kind of just did my work and slept and ate and that's all I could do. I remember feeling really overwhelmed and like- Yeah, you were in survival mode. Survival, right? And everybody who experiences that is you're just literally getting by. And I kept up patient care with no problems or anything like that, but that's about all I could do is survive. But during that time, um, he went through his own, and he would share this publicly, Lyme disease and diagnosis, and then um, past concussion. So he had brain trauma and unresolved old trauma. And again, he would be glad to share that. And so did I. I had, I had the mold. So it's like the, like that we laugh about. We're, we're good friends now. And we understand like the divorce caused us both to awaken, and it was meant to be. It was okay. We're in great spaces. But when we look back and analyze the things that led up to the divorce, it's so interesting to me because because he had brain damage and I had brain damage and some of it was related to relating to another person. And wow. I look back and I think the mold was partially responsible on my part for not being able to completely connect on the level that I normally would. Um, and don't you see that with your patients? Like the relationships can really be torn apart. Oh my gosh. It's, well, it's so difficult anyway, just to navigate yeah. the, the health part of it, the financial part of it, the stress part of it in a marriage. And especially when, you know, one person's really severely affected and the other person's not, 
it can be, and the other person looks totally normal. Yeah. <laughs> That's why things like, like doing the MRI and, and doing some of the lab testing and, and that kind of thing can really help um, the partners to understand. And then, but then the other thing that I find is that a lot of times the partner that didn't think that they were affected once they're in a clean environment again, they actually realized, oh yeah, I was getting more headaches or, you know, I was a little bit, you know, had a shorter fuse. I was a little moodier, um, you know, things that weren't as um, clear. As clear. Yeah. yeah. So what would you tell people if the, the question we always get, I'm sure you get the same as, well, what's the one test for mold, <laughs> right? If there were such a thing, but how would you approach the people listening, right? What's the one test? Um, what, what, what's your approach as far as testing and kind of trying to find out the answer besides their history, which is a big clue for us. What else would you tell patients to look for? It really depends on someone's budget. Um, and, you know, more and more, um, like I just had somebody this past week where they had known water damage in their house <laughs> they, that they hadn't fixed properly because people don't, a lot of times don't know, you know, a drywall gets wet and you're in almost any climate and it doesn't get dried in 24 to 48 hours. It's, it's more than likely going to have mold. And then if you've had an ongoing leak, <laughs> forget it. Right. So the least expensive thing is to take care of the house, <laughs> to take care of the building, you yeah. know, just get that inspected and evaluated. And, you know, if you have these common set of symptoms oh, and you have a known um, exposure, then let's treat you and let's get better. If people have the resources, mm -hmm. then I really like to do a combination of testing. It's really hard for me to just do one. <laughs> so I, I like to do the mycotoxin testing. Um, I like to see what their baseline is without any assistance detoxifying. Mm -hmm. And then with the real-time lab, when I use that company, I like to do some type of a, um, a boost to see if they've just been storing it up that hardly any's coming out. So some either doing um, hyperbarics or saunas, but my, my go-to is to do a really nice dose of liposomal glutathione. But, you know, it's really, it's nice if we can do both the real-time lab and the Great Plains together because the Great Plains uses a different technology. So sometimes they pick up things that the real-time won't and they have more microtoxins that they test for. <laughs> Um, and then I'm also really um, finding some benefit with um, the ProGene DX, uh, Shoemaker's um, newer lab that he's using. It's also another really nice piece of the puzzle to see yeah. the upregulation and downregulation of certain genes and to see how severe people are. So, okay, this is the chemical engineering side. I love it. <laughs> you want me, me to too. just do one test? <laughs> I, know, I know. That's why I laughed at the question because I knew you'd laugh. People are like, oh, there's no one test, <laughs> but I wish. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes if not, you know, if, um, if there's anything suspicious with the, with either when people have moved in, when there's been water damage, just going right to that yeah. is, is sometimes helpful. If you have the right inspector. Yes. It's, um, right. that's been the, the bane of my existence with, with, <laughs> with finding mold is if you have a, a mold inspector who just comes in and does air samples and it's a negative test, throw it out and start over with somebody who does the, the testing on the dust. <laughs> oh, I love that. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, no. And the other thing that I look for with the mold inspector is do they protect themselves? Yeah. If they don't put on a mask and, you know, suits, <laughs> they don't understand how dangerous their job is and they're not going to be looking hard enough for me and for my patients. So I need, I, you know, I really need my patients to look for the inspector that gets it. They understand that this really, that they can't miss it. It might be, uh, you know, it, impossible for the patient to heal if they don't find the mold and get rid of it. Yeah. So love every bit of what you just said. And I just want to point out to our listeners a few really important things. First of all, we can do all the IVs, binders, glutathione treatments in the world. But if you are a patient and you're still living in a really moldy environment, none of that, it's like bailing out a boat that has a leak where you're just continually kind of they may be making a progress, but not even really keeping it afloat. It will eventually sink. So it's so important if you do have an exposure, don't spend your money on the labs if you have a budget and you can't. We love the labs. That will help us. But if you have to deal with finances and decisions, 
get out of the house, remediate the house, find the source. And it's hard because none of these things are cheap. And like Anne said, I've seen people where one, two, three, four, even the five inspectors show no issues with air quality testing. And I'm all about a great inspector, not just the dust sampling, but I find that often that dust sampling does more of a historical snapshot. And we can, we can take um, the, M, the uh, ERMI test is a real common test. Um, that is dust sampling DNA of the molds themselves. The newer testing is called EMMA and it's mycotoxins, so the toxins that are produced by the mold. They both have value, but neither one by themselves are perfect. I still like the ERMI because I've seen enough of them that I can see patterns, but I will say, and this may get kind of complicated, there's a scoring system, which I won't go into, but there's a score at the bottom of the ERMI. That's been fairly unvalid, like it's not very valid as a number. I don't even use that, but what I do- I definitely is, don't use the hurts me. Test. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -mm. But I like to look at the specific molds that come back, and I do still find they're valid because I'm gonna look at catomium and stachy for sure. And if you have more than five, I'm gonna until proven otherwise, I'm gonna assume there's an issue. And on your scoring, that's not gonna be a huge big deal, perhaps. So, and then inspectors again, someone who actually knows what to look at in the floors, picking up your carpet corners, looking at your windows, looking at your basement, looking at your laundry room and your washer, looking under your sinks, and actually having meters to test for volatile organic solvents, so VOC meter checking for moisture, infrared cameras. I mean, they should have a lot of equipment too. And the suits, like you said. If they, if they don't bring suitcase of, suitcases of equipment, <laughs> they probably aren't quite prepared either. No, and they need to spend hours there. Yeah, because this yeah. is it's, a, it's like a massive, it's, I don't envy them at all because as much as our work is detective work, that's a hard, hard thing because it's mostly invisible. The worst molds are sticky, um, like moist, stuck in the corner. They're not in the air. They're not visible usually. So they have to be really understanding construction and construction defects. And just because you have a home that's new or multi-million dollars, that does not exclude you at all. Some of the worst situations I've seen in very expensive homes that are fairly new built. So sadly. And a lot of these things really are hidden. You know, the patient that I mentioned earlier, um, one window had a teeny sign that there might be a little bit of moisture, but all the rest of the windows, it wasn't enough water to soak through and show any staining through the paint, but every window had mold around it. Wow. Wow. And like you said, yeah, all the day. And that's what I see nowadays. Like my friend's house who has an excellent rated builder, there was massive issues with construction. And nowadays I think things are put up fairly quickly. Materials are more like cardboard. So they're porous, a lot more porous materials are used. And it's not guaranteed that you're going to have a bad builder, but just because you have a new home, sometimes an old 1950s well-built built solid home is way better situation than a 19, you know, or a 2010 build, something that's pretty recent. I was looking for a house last weekend and went into one um, that was under construction. They had just done the drywall. They weren't even finished with the drywall. And I could tell that the drywall had gotten wet. There were some watermarks in it. So wow. if I had seen it later on where they had already painted over it, there would have already been a mold problem. Yeah. And, and those are nitus because they often already have spores that are just dormant. So they get water and it's all over then. Um, and we're getting tons of questions, Anne. I wonder, we talked about a little bit of diagnosis, which is great. And I wish we could go so deep into that, but basics are mycotoxins, blood work, genetics, um, all of these things play into it. And if you have a good doctor treating you, they're probably going to do an assessment, whatever you can afford, but within all those realms. And you kind of need that data to really make a picture of what's happening and how to treat. Um, we're getting lots of questions about symptoms. So what are the most common symptoms that you see with mold exposure? Okay. So... Um, what we're actually getting sick from with the mold are, are the VOCs, the, the chemicals that mold makes that you can smell usually, and the mycotoxins that you can't smell. Um, there are thousands of them. So different chemicals cause different symptoms. So almost every system in the body can be affected. So it can be everything from um, you know, lung symptoms it can be um, hormonal symptoms. They can totally disrupt your hormones. And so you might start to have some um, early menopause, hot flashes, high and low hormones. It can affect your thyroid. So take that on for the endocrine system. Um, it can cause severe fatigue. Um, one of the common things that I see is body pain. Like what I experienced, like there was no explanation for it. It was just my, it was like my body was on fire. So joint pain, muscle pain, muscle fasciculations, um, the things like we talked about, it can even affect your vision with the, with the depth perception. Um, let's see, 
a gastrointestinal, like <laughs> a lot of people will have um, uh, flare-ups of their inflammatory bowel disease, but even disruptions in the microbiome, things like nausea, heartburn. Um, what am I leaving out? Uh, brain some people, filter, right? Oh gosh, the yeah. brain. Is <laughs> so many people will have um, brain fog or headaches, um, a, a mood. So yeah. a lot with um, depression and anxiety, it can be huge. Like some people will say, oh, I've never had, had anxiety and I have it now. Other people will say, I've always been a little anxious, but now it's out of control. Like I just can't get calmed down. And I, pretty much every person that I've seen with OCD, yeah. they, they've been in mold. Gosh, that's so, so true. Insomnia. So sleep is a big issue oh, or hypersomnia. It can go either way, which means you, you sleep all the time and can't feel refreshed or you cannot sleep, which is of course disruptive. I remember, um, you know, as I was detoxing, there was a building that I would go to weekly for church and it had mold. And uh, every day after church, I'd be driving home and the world was ending. Like I'm a pretty happy person. I've actually never experienced significant depression or anxiety of any sort. And I remember just like, and when you're in that mood, that state after the mold, there's not a lot of insight, which means you don't know that you're not normal, <laughs> which is hilarious. Cause I'm literally like, going home and talking to my ex-husband and like, oh my gosh, everything's terrible. Or I'd be like some small conversation would make me cry. <laughs> and it, it wasn't me. And I kind of knew it wasn't me. Like what is going on? And it happened every day, like clockwork as we're driving home. I finally realized that there was stacky batteries in that building, but it was interesting because especially if you're listening and you haven't typically had anxiety or depression and it's new. I mean, I know another colleague, she's an MD, her and her daughter bought a house in Texas and they had horrible mold toxicity, got very, very sick, ended up moving out of the house. And later they found out that house, the back portion, which was full of mold, had had two homicides and a suicide. <sighs> and different people, different families. And I'm like, I believe that was related to the mold. I, I don't know for sure. But statistically speaking, that would be an almost impossible situation. And we know mold can cause these things. And it, to me, it was shocking. And she was convinced, she's a neurologist. She was convinced as well that there was definitely something wrong um, with the house. So it definitely messes with people's neurotransmitters, you know, that sense of well being to, um, you know, just yeah. so angry. Like if yeah. I hear, if I hear somebody's gotten a really short fuse, like they just don't have the capacity to deal with anything that frustrates them. Yeah, totally. The, the, yeah, the um, irritability for sure. Uh, and then one thing with the brain, we talked about general brain and brain fog. Brain fog isn't really a medical term, but patients know what we mean. So we use it a lot. I, I use it a lot. My neuropsychologist friend is like, please don't use that term. It doesn't mean anything. <laughs> but the truth is for us and for patients, at least that they get, they're like, oh yeah, that's exactly what it is. But what I was going to say, Anne, that's very specific is assimilation of new knowledge. So if you're reading a book and all of a sudden your comprehension of new material, you have to read over and over again. Um, and also short-term memory. So you're reading over because you can't remember two paragraphs above of what it was, or you get to the chapter the next night and you have to reread because you can't remember what you read the night before. Or words, word finding. Um, in my worst state, I would, the cognitive didn't affect so much as the words. I would want to say cat and I would say dog, or I'd say, what's that word, that thing, that X, Y, Z. And I describe it, but I couldn't get the word quick like that. Um, so those are kind of things that are unique in some ways to mold. And the other thing is executive function. So the capacity to make decisions, like integrate information and then decide what you're going to do about something. Yeah. And I see that a lot of times, like it, it, a lot of times, especially when people are dealing with mold and they're having to decide, do I hire this inspector? Do I go with this remediator? Do I just sell my house? Like, you know, all those, that decision making, they feel incapacitated sometimes. Yeah. I just, and that's a hard thing is we have to be there with the, um, I want to talk about treatments, but before we do, I want to mention one more thing, and I'm sure you'll agree with me here. I've seen in the years, almost a hundred percent of cases with mold, there's a trauma component because I can't explain the details of it, but we know it affects amygdala. Amygdala is fight or flight and trauma. And I have yet to see someone that doesn't, that gets better, that doesn't deal with old. And when we say trauma, I always like to clarify, because it doesn't mean you were abused as a child. It doesn't necessarily mean you had a horrible childhood or difficult parents. Um, some of the people that I treat have lovely childhoods, amazing parents. But when you're two and your sister gets ice cream and you don't, and it gets stuck in your brain in a certain cycle where you feel unlovable because of that, 
that could be trauma, as silly as it is. So we all have it. We all have little bits and pieces of these things. And what I see is somehow mold amplifies that response. And so there's a lot of PTSD with mold and getting re-exposed and all of those things. So I just want to acknowledge if you're listening and you've had that, you're like, you're feeling maybe ashamed of how, how hard it is for you to, you know, go outside and go to new buildings or to go all these things. It's very real. So Anne, I'd love comments or thoughts about that. If yeah, you um, I, do, I do think that um, dealing with feeling unsafe where you're living is trauma in itself. Like we should be able to have our little cocoons where we know we can sleep safely at night. And, um, and I, but I think our bodies kind of anticipate yeah. it. And so then we, that those kind of PTSD or um, I call it the limbic loop gets, yes. gets activated. And one of the things that I found as far as treatment, in addition, like the two big treatment things I think <laughs> are getting in a clean environment as clean as you can and then resetting this limbic system. So either doing um, uh, neurofeedback, if you have access to a neurofeedback clinic, that's great. If you don't like what... I haven't talked about my mold exposure where I developed uh, asthma four years ago, but at that time, my limbic state just like I couldn't like 95% of buildings I'd walk into and I couldn't breathe. Right. So um, the, using the muse, which is a little headband, you're familiar with it, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, it, it dramatically changed my set point for how even now years later, my body interprets stressful um, <laughs> situations. Wow. So when you're in that limbic state, you've got to be, um, it's truly the survival state. So your body starts to become hyper vigilant. So, because it's like you're moving the tribe and you need to notice where the berries are going to be right tomorrow and you need to come back and pick them. And there's some, some tiger tracks over here and there's, um, signs of the cannibals over here. <laughs> so it's, you know, t taking every, little signal to the nth degree and looking for danger and survival. And so we, to, for the body to be able to shift back more into a restorative state, getting out of that, you know, more P PTSD limbic state is, is a really important part of treatment for a lot of us. Wow. I love that you're going deeper. And from my experience, I haven't used, it's funny, I got the muse, you're going to laugh. So I put it on and it was like, detector, uh, sensor not detected, sensor not detected. After like 30 minutes, I went, I didn't do this, but I wanted to throw it across the room and say, this is counterproductive. <laughs> I literally was like, ah, this is so frustrating. I am not getting into alpha state. So I gave it away to a friend, but I might, I might get another one. <laughs> but I have a new one that I okay. think it's easier to, 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 to I'm kind of embarrassed to admit that, but that's what happened. It went away. <laughs> but I was going to say some other tools, DNRS, that's a really yes. common program. It is not the only or best program out there. There's, but what it is, is, is uh, neural retraining and then any sort of neural feedback. Um, the via light is a light system that can retrain the brain and then any sort of somatic based trauma therapy. So EMDR, thought field therapy, um, brain spotting, um, just somatic experiencing. So there's huge ranges of things and there's probably a lot more because I'm not the expert, but all of these things are really critical to healing too. And I see, you know, whatever a person gravitates towards seems to help. Like it's just a matter of doing it, whatever thing to help get out of that um, traumatic state is really, really helpful. And for me, um, having, I, I've also done 40 years of Zen, Dave Asprey's um, yeah. uh, <laughs> brain retraining, which is amazing. Um, I've realized that I, ha that I actually had a fairly significant brain trauma when I was two, I got electrocuted. And, um, and fortunately, I guess it was young enough. I was um, and resilient enough that I had a lot of rewiring <laughs> happening after that. So I could still um, do what I do. Um, but I feel like um, having done this neurofeedback kind of thing, I feel different in my body now than I've ever, can I, I can ever remember feeling as far as stress. So I think it's good for all of us. <laughs> to, I do. I'm, in, I'm like, I'm going to do that. <laughs> you got to remind me to, to actually act on that because that sounds like something I could really use. I feel like my awakening since the divorce and a mold and all these things has been really that so I've done a lot of therapy, somatic based therapy, EMDR, brain spotting, and I've done, I didn't do the muse, but I have done other, and they're so valuable because it really gets you to a place of, and I feel like if I go to a hotel that's moldy, I have a reaction, granted, I'm still reactive, but it does not take me down like it used to. So it is very, it creates more resilience. Right? I would have said that, but I, um, yeah, I, 
back in January, I stayed in a place that really got me. And I, I think I had gotten so that I was a little bit cavalier about it. I was like, oh, I can handle it now. Right. <laughs> right. I know. And I should have um, taken action, but it's, you know, it's all learning, right? It is. Um, and at, at my body, and I know yours too, like when I, it's all of these things are lessons that, that then we get to take back to our patients and <laughs> help them exactly. More. And I keep learning and learning. And then I think, Oh, I kind of know that no, there's more lessons. Always. <laughs> uh, we gloss over treatment as far as we talk about the brain, talk about trauma. Let's talk just a little bit about, and then I'll try to look for questions um, like the basics of treatment. So we, you have to get out of the exposure. We've clearly talked about that. There is a part of some sort of training your brain um, and dealing with that amygdala overaction, the limbic loop, whatever you want to call it. And those are all critical pieces. What about just practical supplements and things? What do you like to use? Yeah, I'm, I, I find that supplements are very, very help, helpful because we, a lot of times we just can't get these extra needs that our body has when we're, when our bodies are overloaded. So like if I had to just pick a few things on a desert island kind of thing, or like, yeah, oh my yeah. gosh, when, um, when COVID was sitting, I was like, oh, what do we need to order a whole bunch of in case we Me have too. some supply line issues? <laughs> I was like, oh my God, we cannot run out of these things. Exactly. For our are you it still was, overstocked from that? Making sure that your, your clinic. We are yeah. in good shape. We are in <laughs> really good shape good. on a few things, good. immune system support. And then um, detox support. Really so good. So good. Yeah, me too. <laughs> so good. Well, you're a <laughs> island, but with that. Oh yeah, go ahead. Um, so liposomal glutathione, that is so instrumental for me because I know I have particular genetic predispositions to not make glutathione optimally and then when it gets depleted. So liposomal glutathione and then um, binders. And I find you know, different people respond differently to different binders and um, often a combination of them is best. So things like pectisol, clay, charcoal um, are my, are my favorite combinations. How about you? Oh yeah. I, um, same thing, clay, charcoal, um, pectisol, there's a glycomannan. Um, there is zeolite could be great for metals and, um, aluminum and things. If you sometimes I'll add that in with those issues. Uh, I like the combinations and I feel, you know, there's a lot of talk about cholestyramine as a prescription, which is great for ochre toxin, um, but it's not as good for stachy and ketomium toxins. Um, and then I feel like charcoal is actually your best bet for some of the T2 toxins and, and those. I really recovered with primarily charcoal. I never took cholestyramine, which surprises people. Um, I took it back in the day. That was really the only protocol that was out there and uh, it made me sicker. So I, I've had very few patients now that I've treated with. And now some, if they have tons of ochre toxin, that's all they have. I will absolutely, I use, definitely use it, but it's just not always the only thing. And it's not the first line for most people. And especially, and I don't know about you, but we tend to see really sensitive people that they're the worst of the worst as far as their symptoms. And I find they don't tolerate those really harsh or more powerful binders. They're powerful, but they're also more harsh on the system too. Yeah. And I feel like what we're doing with the whole detoxification pathway is we're kind of opening a series of dams. And so if we open up one dam too much, it can flood. And so, especially for those of us that are kind of sensitive, we have to start kind of carefully and gradually titrate up. I find um, also on the supplement side that there's a lot of mitochondrial damage. So I like to use things like MitoQ and CoQ10 and um, NAD and things that really be vitamins that feed the the mitochondria. And then most people have had some damage to their mitochondrial membranes and their cell membranes. So they really need things like phosphatidylcholine and, um, and then good fats. Like a yes. low fat diet is not what you want to be doing <laughs> when you're recovering from a mold illness. So good fats like, um, you know, avocado and olives and olive oil and Mm. Um, nuts and seeds that aren't moldy. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. It's a hard, well, you know, that's a little thing we didn't talk about diet. I usually do recommend people go on a fairly low mold diet. That's not the cure, but if you're adding to your load by ingesting things like um, in a coffee that's not tested, um, chocolate, two of my favorite food groups, <laughs> but those two coffee and chocolate, they're grown in humid climates. They're commonly contaminated with both pesticides and with mold. So you want to make sure, um, I don't know what your brands you like, but Bulletproof and Purity are my two go-to coffee brands. Definitely. Bullet, bulletproof is, um, I, you know, they were leading the way with this. Um, Dave asked, we put out the moldy movie documentary early on that you know, at least I felt so great about that because it was like people started to at least become aware of it in a greater number of um, people yeah. 
watch the movie. <laughs> and then nuts and seeds can definitely be contaminated if they're not fresh. You want to store them in your freezer or fridge if possible. Um, and then things like berries and stuff that sat too long, leftovers, anything that sits for a long time is a, a bigger mold issue. Um, particular nuts, pistachio, cashew, and peanut are more moldy than the others. So you kind of just have to be careful. And some people will tolerate more of those than others. Um, and uh, and then sugar. Sugar is so toxic for if you have mold. So well, I and, highly recommend yeah. And grains. Yeah. I really want to not eat grains if you if you can. Yeah. Yeah, go, especially corn, but they're all, I, I grew up on a farm, so I know that, I know how this actually works, and grains are harvested, and then they're stored in these silos, and the silos, they actually uh, measure the moisture content, which is usually quite high, because they had silos have dryers in them to dry the grains, but this grain just piles up there in moist kind of situation, it is always moldy, and that's actually, they have certain mold contents, depending on where they're selling or buying the grain from, uh, again, I'm not the expert, but I know enough growing up on the farm that I realized, wow, the grains and silos that they're stored in, massive mold issues usually aspergillus but it's a big deal yeah what was the, what did they call that the silo workers lungs yeah which is yeah. aspergillosis which i can never say <laughs> it's the lungs yeah exactly um wow i can't believe we just like blew through an hour like that <laughs> well jill i i love the time with you i just feel so aligned with um with how we want to contribute on the planet and I, it's such a pleasure to, to get to visit with you <laughs> thank you and the same and you are so brilliant so many beautiful pieces even listening to them, like oh that's a great analogy I'm going to use that <laughs> so thank well, you I feel the great. same way <laughs> <laughs> oh, tell people be sure to I'll put this in the links but tell people where they can find you and I'd love to know if there's anything you're up to or any interesting books you're reading oh oh my gosh yes um so AnnShippyMD.com, and um, we're putting out blogs and that kind of thing on a regular basis, and then on Instagram and Facebook, just AnnShippyMD.com. You know, it's been an interesting time these last few months. I, I have mostly been, um, you know, that nerd <laughs> that sits there at night and evenings reading about things that I think can really help with resilience. So... Um, uh, that's really taken up most of my time lately. I can't wait to have time to just read a book and <laughs> I, I know, right? I have a stack of books. I'm like, <laughs> got a whole stack. Let me think about what's on my on my stack. Oh gosh, I have so many. Um, uh, nothing is coming to mind. I am totally unemployed. It's there. usually again, you bring great science into it. It's probably that's where I've been too. I'm like, okay. Uh, um, my, my, yeah. Yeah. I'm really just like, it's such an amazing time to read through the literature with the lens on that I have right now, because mm -hmm. I think the real question for all of us to be asking right now is what can we do to be more resilient? Yeah. Like what is going to make us so that whatever comes next, you know, with what's going on right now and what comes, comes next, what can we do, be doing to have, you know, our bodies and our families and friends and um, colleagues, everybody just be less affected by what's happening on the planet. Gosh, that's a great, great way to end because resili resiliency, you and I both just always are seeking for that. And I think just leaving you with, we always have a chance to become more resilient because even if we're here and we don't like where we're at and we have symptoms, we can take the next step. And Granted, it's great if you have access to doctors like Ann and I, not everybody does, but there's always things you can do like uh, choose better foods. I always say clean air, clean water, clean food. And those things, granted, you might need to buy an air filter or get organic produce, but they're relatively easy and less expensive and you can start there. So we'll kind of leave you with that. And thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Ann, for joining me. We will have to do this again soon. Yes, I'd love to. Bye-bye. <laughs>